friends, my name is Mrs. Bell and I'm here to read you a story and to talk about character traits. Today we're going to read the story, The Gruffalo. I, what I want you to think about when you're reading is I want you to think about the mouse. How could you describe the mouse? The definition of character traits is words that describe a character's personality or qualities that make them who they are. I want you to think, how would you describe the character to a friend? So if you had to talk about the mouse, how would you describe them to a friend? Let's get started. The Gruffalo. A mouse took a stroll through the deep dark wood. A fox saw the mouse and the mouse looked good. Where are you going to, little brown mouse? Come and have lunch in my underground house. It's terribly kind of you, fox, but no, I'm going to have lunch with a Gruffalo. A Gruffalo? What's a Gruffalo? A Gruffalo? Why didn't you know? He has terrible tusks and terrible claws and terrible teeth and his terrible jaws. Where are you meeting him? Here by these rocks. And his favorite food is roasted fox. Roasted fox? Oh my, fox said. Goodbye, little mouse. And away he sped. Silly old fox. Doesn't he know? There's no such thing as a Gruffalo. On with the mouse to the deep dark wood. An owl saw the mouse and the mouse looked good. Where are you going to, little brown mouse? Join me for tea in my treetop house. It's frightfully nice of you, owl, but no. I'm going to have tea with a Gruffalo. A Gruffalo? What's a Gruffalo? A Gruffalo, why didn't you know? He has knobbly knees and turned out toes and a poisonous wart at the end of his nose. Where are you meeting him? Here by this stream. And his favorite food is owl ice cream. Owl ice cream, to it, to who? Goodbye, little mouse, and away owl flew. Silly old owl, doesn't he know there's no such thing as a gruffalo? On with the mouse through the deep dark wood. A snake saw the mouse and the mouse looked good. Where are you going to, little brown mouse? Come for a feast in my log pile house. It's wonderfully good of you, snake, but no, I'm having a feast with a Gruffalo. A Gruffalo? What's a Gruffalo? A Gruffalo? Why didn't you know? His eyes are orange, his tongue is black, he has purple prickles all over his back. Where are you meeting him? Here by this lake. And his favorite food is scrambled snake. Scrambled snake, it's time I hid. Goodbye, little mouse, and away snake slid. Silly old snake, doesn't he know there's no such thing as a Gruffalo? Uh, oh, but who is this creature with terrible claws and terrible teeth and his terrible jaws? He has knobbly knees and turned out toes and a poisonous wart at the end of his nose. His eyes are orange, his tongue is black. He has purple prickles all over his back. Oh, help! Oh, no! It's a Gruffalo! My favorite food, the Gruffalo said. You'll taste good on a slice of bread. Good, said the mouse. Don't call me good. I'm the scariest creature in the deep dark wood. Just walk behind me and soon you'll see everyone is afraid of me. Oh, sure, said the Gruffalo, bursting with laughter. You lead and I'll follow after. They walked and walked till the Gruffalo said, I hear a hiss in the grass ahead. It's Snake, said the mouse. Why, Snake, hello. Snake took one look at the Gruffalo. Oh, dear, he said. Goodbye, little mouse, and slid right into his log pile house. You see, said Mouse, I told you so. Amazing, said the Gruffalo. They walked some more till the Gruffalo said, I hear a hoot in the trees ahead. It's Owl, said the Mouse. Why, Owl, hello. Owl took one look at the Gruffalo. Boo-hoo, he said. Goodbye, little mouse, and flew right up to his treetop house. You see, said Mouse, I told you so. Astounding, said the Gruffalo. They walked some more till the Gruffalo said, I hear some paws on the path ahead. 
It's Fox, said the mouse. Why, Fox, hello. Fox took one look at the Gruffalo. Oh, help, he said. Goodbye, little mouse, and ran right into his underground house. The mouse said, Gruffalo, now you see, everyone is afraid of me. But now my tummy is starting to rumble, and my favorite food is Gruffalo Crumble. Gruffalo Crumble, the Gruffalo cried, and quick as the wind, he turned and fled. All was quiet in the deep dark wood. The mouse found a nut and the nut was good. The end. Okay friends, now that we've finished our reading The Gruffalo, I have made something to help us with our character traits. This is our mouse. These are the character traits that I thought would describe him. Now remember, character traits are words that describe a character's personality or qualities that make them who they are. Remember, you were to think about how you would describe the mouse while we were reading? So what I did is I took some words that I thought described the mouse. We have tricky, smart, sneaky, funny, a quick thinker, and brave. Do you agree with those? I thought they were good too. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick two. I'm going to put them in the trait box. We are going to write a sentence with it in a complete sentence. And then we're going to do trait two and do the same thing. This one down here, you're gonna do on your own at home. So if you need a second, go get a piece of paper so you can take notes while we're doing this. Okay, so what we're going to do, I picked tricky first. Tricky. Now think about how the mouse is tricky. So when we start our sentence, we always want to start it with repeating our question back into our answer. So we're, we are talking about the character traits. So we want to say the mouse is tricky because, and then we'll talk about how we figure that out. So I wrote, the mouse is tricky because he. So think about what he did in the story. Why is he tricky? So when I think about the mouse and how he was tricky, I think about how when one of the animals, like the fox, asked him in to have a, have a treat, he said, no, I'm going to have lunch with a Gruffalo. So we're gonna put that into a sentence. The mouse is tricky because he fooled the animals by telling them he was meeting ran out of lines. That happens all the time to us, doesn't it? So remember that all sentences start with a capital letter and end with a punctuation. So I said, the mouse is tricky because he fooled the animals by telling them he was meeting the Gruffalo. Do you agree with that? I thought that one was good. So we're going to use the same strategy that we used with tricky with another trait. Which one do you think would be the best? Brave, quick thinker, funny, smart, or sneaky? What do you think? I thought so too. I think I'm gonna use brave. I'm gonna put brave there. So how do you think we're gonna start our sentence again? How do you think? Should we use our sentence starter? The mouse is brave because he, I think so too. The mouse is brave because he, think about the story. What part of the story did the mouse seem brave to you? Now, I don't know about you, but if I see an animal that looks like the Gruffalo, I'm gonna run and I'm gonna go hide somewhere. Did the mouse do that? 
No, he didn't. What he did is he went with the Gruffalo and said, everyone is scared of me. And the Gruffalo didn't believe him, right? But that was brave because the animals could have said, oh, pfft, and they ate him or something, you know? So let's write that down in a sentence in a complete thought. The mouse is brave because he, let's think, told the Gruffalo that everyone was afraid of him and took him to meet everyone. Does that sound okay? I think so. The mouse is brave because he took the Gruffalo to show him everyone. Remember he said, everyone is afraid of me. And you can use that because it's from your text. Everyone is That looks good. Okay, so remember our trait is brave. We put in a complete sentence with a capital letter and punctuation. We used our sentence stem. The mouse is brave because, and we made a complete thought. Pretty simple. The mouse is brave because he took the Gruffalo to show him everyone is afraid of me. So we might wanna put quotes around that, right? Because we took it from the book. Those mean that you took it from the author and it's not your independent thought. So remember that if you're quoting a book or an author or somebody else's thoughts, you have to put quotations around it. So let's review. Today we read the book, The Gruffalo. We talked about what character traits were. Character traits are words that describe a character's personality or qualities that make them who they are. Remember to think, how would you describe the character to your friends? Then we read the book. Then we did our trait chart, character traits. Trait one was tricky. We put it into his complete sentence with a capital letter and a period. Trait two, brave, capital letter, period. We talked about quotations briefly. Now what you're going to do at home is you're gonna use what you learned here today and you're going to find trait three. You're gonna write it in a complete thought using a capital letter and a punctuation. Thank you so much for joining me today. Remember, my name is Mrs. Bell. Thank you for reading The Gruffalo and talking about character traits. Have a wonderful day, friends. Mrs. Gillum and today our lesson is focused on the letters and sounds of the alphabet. As much as I love teaching you the alphabet, today I'm going to give my time to my good friend Sonny the Pig. He is very excited about teaching the alphabet to you today. This lesson was designed for grades K through 2, but Sonny says anyone can join in. During the lesson, Sunny will practice the letters and sounds with you and remind you of the ways that you can practice at home. Bring your good listening ears and your good memory and your willingness to practice to this lesson so you can become a better reader. Okay, I think we're ready to learn. It's all up to you now, Sunny. Well, that is the end of our lesson with Sunny today. But remember to keep practicing the alphabet and the sounds until you don't need any help remembering them. The letters and sounds are the basic building blocks of becoming a good reader. It was wonderful to be with you today. And I'm so glad that Sunny could be with us too. I'm Mrs. Gillum and Sunny wants you to remember Pigs can read. I'm so glad you could be here with me today to read this book. It's an alphabet book. And it is a farm alphabet book. And I love the farm 
because that's where I grew up. The Farm Alphabet Book by Jane Miller. A is for A, like apple. Apples are picked in the late summer and autumn when they are ripe. B says B, like bull. A bull is a calf's father. It is a large, strong animal. C says K, like cat. A calf is a young cow or bull. D says D like donkey. Donkeys are in the fields when they are not pulling carts. E says E like egg. Birds lay eggs. These eggs were laid by a hen. F says F like foal. A foal is a young horse. Its mother is a mare. Its father is a stallion. G says G like goat. A young goat is a kid like you. Its mother is a nanny goat. Its father is a billy goat. H says like hen. A hen is the mother of a chick. The chick's father is a rooster. I says it like incubator. An incubator keeps eggs warm. After 21 days, the chicks hatch out of the eggs. J says j like jam. Jam is made from fruit boiled with sugar and water. K says k like kitten. A kitten is a young cat. L says u like lamb. A lamb is a young sheep. Its mother is a ewe. Its father is a ram. M says mmm like mouse. A mouse sleeps during the day and finds food at night. N says mmm like nest. Nests are built by birds. Birds lay their eggs in nests. This is a coot's nest. O can say O oh, like orchard. Fruit from trees grow in orchards. P says P like pig. You guessed it, pig. The mother pig is called a sow. The father pig is called a boar. A young pig like me is called a piglet. Q says Qu like the word quill. A quill is a large feather. It grows in a bird's wing or tail. A quill can be used as a pen. R says rrr, like rabbit. Tame rabbits are kept as pets. Wild rabbits live in burrows under the ground. S says S for swan. A mother swan teaches her cygnets to swim as soon as they are hatched. T says T for tractor. A tractor pulls machines on the farm. U says uh for umbrella. Today, we're going to practice the alphabet together. I'm Sonny the Pig, and I think you should practice the alphabet with me. 
Why? Why should you practice with me? Because pigs can read. That's right. Pigs can read. How? How can a pig read? Well, a spider taught me. Everyone gets taught to read by family, by a teacher, and maybe even a spider. You could learn from a spider like me. Remember that you need to learn the capital letters and the lowercase letters. The big letters and the little letters. Because all the things you want to read will have big letters and little letters. So you have to learn to read them all. Today, we're going to practice. We're going to say the letters together. Then the letters will do a flip. And we will say the letter sounds and the word that helps us remember the letter sounds. Because that's what you have to know to read the letter sounds. Okay. Are you ready? I am, so here we go. A, B, C, D. Now we'll say the sounds. A says A ah, like apple. B says B like baby. C says K like cat. And D says D like dog. Let's say them again. A, B, C, D. Good job. E, F, G. E says eh like egg. F says f like fox. G says g like girl. Let's say them again. E, F, G. H, I, J. Here come the sounds. H says ha, like hat. I says it like igloo. J says j like jam and jelly. Yum. Let's say them again. H, I, J. K L M. Let's say the sounds. K says k like kite. L says oo like lion. M says mmm like map. Good job. Let's say them again. K L M. N O P and the sounds N says N like nest O says Ah like octopus P says P like pig like me pig let's say them again N O P good job Q, R, S, T. Q says qu like queen. R says r like. Hello everyone, my name is Raya Rivers. I am the Lead Literacy Interventionist for Kansas City Public School District. 
And I am here today to teach you four ways to say and spell long A. If you were with us last time, you know, we went over these four different ways. Then we did a read aloud, or I read you uh, a story where we were able to practice two ways of those four ways to spell, say, and read long A. So we're going to go over those four ways today, and then I'm going to read another story with you, and we're going to practice the other two ways to spell long A. So by the time you finish watching this video, you will be able to read, spell, and say four ways to say, spell, and read long A. It's a mouthful, but it's very important for me to let you know what we're doing and why we're doing it, because I just want you to keep growing your learning. Hello, we are going to focus on four ways to spell long A, A-E, A-I, A-Y, and E-A. By the time you finish watching this video, you would have spelled read and said four different spellings for long A. Let's get started. We have three words that are on the screen. How do they spell a long A? You're right, AI. I have underlined AI and colored in black so you can remember that this is one of the spellings for long A. Let's read the words. Braid, paid, afraid. If you can remember, we worked on this spelling in the last video from last week. We also did a reading that allowed us to practice saying, spelling, and reading long A that spells A-I. Now, if we pay special attention to this one word, this is how I'm going to um, show you how important it is to clip the consonant sound before you get to the vowel sound. And the word paid, that's the word we're gonna focus on at this moment, paid, aid, aid. If you can hear me, I don't say p, I say p. It's very important that I clip that sound and I don't say p, then aid, because I will have two a sounds. I will have two vowel sounds. And that's not the way that that word is written and the way that I should say it. So always remember that you want to say each sound and don't give it more than one, as in the consonant p, p, not p, p, p. You're gonna hear me refer to that a couple of times because it's so important. And then we have another spelling. Hmm, what sound does that make? E-A makes a A sound, long A sound. E-A. These three words are break, steak, great, break, steak, great, steak. That's my favorite. As you can see, I have underlined E-A and I've colored E-A in black. So you can see that this too is another way for you to spell long A. Now, A-I and E-A, we practiced this in the last video and we did a reading that allowed us to practice these spellings as well. But the next two are two that we went over, but we didn't use them in a reading. And we will do that this time. Away. Yes, A-Y makes what sound? 
A, A. If you put your hand under your mouth, it will allow you to feel how your mouth moves when you say certain sounds, in particular, vowel sounds. In this instance, long A. A. If I were to say a short sound of A, as an apple, apple, what does my mouth do? But when I say A, ooh, I smell. And it goes down and I smell. But ah, ah, it just goes down and I don't smell. So me using my hand and seeing myself say it will help me remember that. Just gonna give you little tidbits throughout the video that help you with your reading and show you what good readers do. Day, not da, but day. Well, that concludes our time together today, but I will see you next week. Please keep practicing because practice makes permanent and I want you again to continue to grow your learning. Read as much as possible whenever you get an opportunity because reading is everywhere and it's so important. I will see you next time. Have a wonderful week. This is Miss Lu again, and here is Chinese for level two students. So uh, we talked about the hobbies and the sports in the last three weeks, and today we're going to continue to learn some uh, vocabulary about the hobbies. Ai hao, ai hao. Okay, so to begin with, like usual, let's do a review of the things we learned last time, which was about yun dong. Ni xi huan shen me yun dong. The vocabulary we learned? Da wang chiu. Da wang chiu. Da wang chiu. Da lan chiu. Da lan chiu. Da lan chiu. Da gan lan chiu. Da gan lan chiu. Da gan lan chiu. Da bang chiu. Da bang chiu. Da bang chiu. And then, shui jiao, shui jiao, shui jiao. So today, we will continue learning some uh, vocabulary about hobbies. So our goal, I can talk about my hobbies. So things you will need a notebook, a pencil to take notes. Get ready. To begin with, the vocabulary for today. Ni xi huan. Do you like Ni Xi Huan Tan Gang Chima? Ni Xi Huan Tan Gang Chima? Tan Gang Chin Tan Gang Chin. Like usual, you're going to pronounce uh, with me together. Then we'll, we're going to take notes for the characters and the pinyin. So, together, Ni Xi Huan Tan Gang Chima? Xi Huan Bu Xi Huan Tan Gang Chin. Ni Xi Huan La. 小提琴吗? 你喜欢拉小提琴吗? 拉小提琴 喜欢不喜欢? 你喜欢看小说吗? 看小说? Novels, read novels 你喜欢看小说吗? 你喜欢画画吗? 画画, 画画。Remember our activity? Hua hua, draw. 你喜欢看电影吗? 看电影, 看电影, 你喜欢看电影吗? 喜欢, 不喜欢? So the five words for today. 弹钢琴, 弹钢琴, 拉小提琴, 拉, 小提琴看小说看小说画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画画
看电影。你有什么爱好 ？So we already learned this sentence structure last uh last time. So 你有什么爱好 ？What hobbies do you have? 你有什么爱好？你喜欢弹钢琴，还是拉小提琴 ？So which one do you prefer? 你喜欢弹钢琴，还是拉小提琴？你喜欢拉小提琴，还是看小说？你喜欢拉小提琴，还是看小说？你喜欢看小说，还是画画？你喜欢看小说还是画画？你喜欢画画还是看电影？你喜欢画画还是看电影？哎、okay, ，Let's 画画 ，Let's 画画。Remember our activity. Say, say if you can remember the pronunciation of the vocabulary. So we have 弹钢琴，弹钢琴，拉小提琴，拉小提琴。看小说，看小说，画画，画画，看电影，看电影。So first one on your notebook, I would like you to 画 I would like you to draw. 嗯，拉小提琴，拉小提琴。So which one is 拉小提琴？拉小提琴。Ready? So, la xiao ti qin is la xiao ti qin play the violin. Okay, la xiao ti qin. The next one, second one, I would like you to draw a picture for tan gang qin. Tan gang qin. So, which one is tan gang qin? Tan gang qin. Tan gang qin is tan gang qin. Tan gang qin. Play the piano. Tan gang qin. Do you get this one correct? Then the third one, the third one. I would like you to draw. It may be a little bit hard to draw. Uh, use your imagination. So, 看电影，看电影。So which one is 看电影，看电影，看电影。So draw a picture for 看电影 on your notebook. 看电影 is ready. 看电影 ，This one watch movies. 看电影 ，Okay. So these are the five words for today. 弹钢琴，拉小提琴，看小说，画画，看电影。Now I would like you to take notes together with me. So for this one, 弹钢琴，弹钢琴。弹钢琴，弹，横竖，横，竖横弯钩，弹，点点，竖，横竖，横横横竖。Remember from last time we learned 弹，弹 ，play. So this action, this action is 弹 Okay. The 钢琴 for piano, 撇，横，横，横，竖钩。This radical is for uh the radical for iron. The radical for iron. 竖，横，竖钩，撇，那，钢。The 琴 basically you write two king at the top, then write a person. Then, 点，横竖，弹钢琴，弹钢琴 ，play the piano， 弹钢琴。Next one， 拉小提琴，拉小提琴 ，play the violin， 拉小提琴，拉小提琴。拉小提琴 ，the hand radical， 点，横，点点横，等小 ，pretty easy to write，write it by yourself， 
xiao, and then ti. Hand radical first. The, the right part is the character for shi, for is, shi. Xiao ti. La xiao ti. Qin. Qin. We just write it for the tangang qin, the same character. So write it down by yourself. Two kings at the top. For the person, dian hang shu. La xiao ti qin. La xiao ti qin. Play the violin. La xiao ti qin. Next one. Kan xiao shu. Kan xiao shu. So kan xiao shu. Read novels. Read novels. Kan xiao shu. The pinyin first. Kan xiao shu. 看小说, so the character for cat. Pie. Hang, hang. Pie. And then the bottom part is the character for eyes, because you need your eyes to see. So the character for eyes, shu. Hang, shu. Hang, hang, hang. Kan. Kan means look or watch here. You uh, watch or look the novels. That's read the novels. Xiao, character for xiao. Shu, you write the radical for speech for speaking. The dian, dian, the mouth radical. The pie. Shu wan go. Kan xiao shu. Read novels. Kan xiao shu. Next one, we have Hua Hua, Hua Hua. So Hua Hua, Hua Hua is pretty easy to write. Hua, Hua, Hua Hua, Hang, Shu, Hang Shu, Hang Shu Hang, Shu Hang. Shu Hua means draw and then the same character write it one more time by yourself. Hua then R Hua 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 Zhuo Hua Hua Okay, do we finish Hua 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 Hua? Then we have the last one for today, which is Kan Ying. Kan Ying. Watch movies. Kan ying. Kan ying. Kan dian ying. Kan dian ying. So the character for can look or watch. We just write it down. So take notes by yourself. Can Look or watch, and the character for eyes is at the bottom. Can and then dian, shu, hang shu, hang hang, then shu wan go, dian, then ying, ying, the character for the song, and then dian, hang, the character for jing as in Beijing. Okay, and then pie pie pie, 电影看电影 watch movies. Okay, so to make a conclusion for the things we learned today, 你有什么爱好？你有什么爱好 ？So if someone asks you, 你有什么爱好 ？What hobbies do you have? You can say, 我喜欢 I like. 我喜欢弹钢琴。我喜欢。拉小提琴，我喜欢看小说，我喜欢画画，我喜欢看电影。Okay, so based on your own information, if someone asks you, 你有什么爱好 ？Now you should be able to tell them your hobbies. 我喜欢 then your hobbies. Okay, so like usual, I would like you to practice writing the characters three times on your notebook and make sure you can recognize. Recognize them at least. Okay, so that's conclude our lesson for today, and it's my pleasure to have you in my class. We'll see you next time.
My name is Paul Turner, Social Studies Coordinator at Kansas City Public Schools. Welcome to Homeroom. What you need today is a pen and paper. Be ready to learn as we talk about the Gilded Age. So when we talk about the Gilded Age, basically we're going to talk about economics and economic opportunities for people. Our objective today, we're going to explain the causes of increased economic opportunity, its effects on society. And we're going to be able to identify members who benefit from the society, basically benefit rather than themselves, right? So, our driving questions today, has rapid industrial development been a blessing or a curse for Americans? Should business be allowed to combine or reduce the competition? And should business be regulated closely by the government? We're going to be able to answer those questions today as we go through this lesson. It's going to be a two-part lesson when we talk about the Gilded Age. Because America started becoming this economic power in the world, right? You know, during this time frame, this is all about the lead-up to American society, right? The Gilded Age basically was a technology revolution. It was basically, you start seeing uh, mass production. You start seeing cheaper ways to do things and basically move America forward. Then you're going to start seeing these wealth inequalities. The rich got richer, the poor really did get poorer. But you start seeing some economic advances for some. America is basically a land of natural resources. We have coal, iron, ore, oil. These all exploded during this time frame. And basically, it made a lot of people rich from that. And again, we had immigrants coming to the United States. They understood that this was a land of opportunity. Right? So you started seeing a lot of Irish coming over. Some Basically, some Southern European, uh, Europeans started to come over. So, it was an opportunity for cheap labor basically for uh, for big businesses. So, why do they call it the Gilded Age? Basically it was a metaphor for the period. Our own Mark Twain, basically from here from, from Missouri, he basically cloned his phrase, it was glittering on the surface but corrupt underneath. The politics of the Gilded Age was characterized as scandal, corruption, but the voter turnout reached at an all-time high. We're talking about some something like 80% of people were voting during this time frame. Then you have this basically was represented by laissez-faire ideology. What does laissez-faire mean? You remember, that's no government intervention or no government regulation. We talked about that term early in the year, right? So, to define this period, we're going to talk about robber barons and captains of industry. Alright? So to define robber barons, basically they use questionable tactics, basically to amass their wealth. So, they were basically, we're going to talk about uh, Rockefeller. What he would do, he would put his friends on these boards of these different companies, right? And basically, he would force them to sell their company to him. We're going to talk about all that stuff. Then we're going to talk about Carnegie, right? He was captain of industry. He was a business leader. Basically, he used his wealth to contribute to society. Some people still bet on Carnegie because the way he treated some of his workers. We're going to talk about some of the Pullman strikes and all these other strikes that happened during his time frame. Alright, so, if I want to build wealth, I need less competition, right? So there's two different ways that you could do this. Two different ways that you could do this. So we're going to call, talk about vertical integration. Basically, they control all aspects of basically the production process. I basically take this natural resources and finish it to the end product, right? But what Rockefeller did... He basically take over emerging the comp competition and put them within his own company. So if you have another oil company, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to put my friend on the board of the oil company and basically have forced them to sell me, me the company. Once I do that, that's less competition. Because guess what? Now I own that company and no competitor is really going to go against me now, right? So we're going to talk about monopolies too. So... Railroad owners took advantage of this laissez-faire, basically, society. You know, they basically use their power and influence to win these government contracts, to get government lands, and basically they took full advantage of it. They got contracts to secure more land. They kept going through this process, and basically kept opening up the West, and basically getting these contracts that benefited them. They started embezzling money. Gompers basically went to jail because he did this stuff, right? Excuse me, I said Gompers. Elliot Gold, excuse me. He basically was embezzling money. 
Then you had basically overinflated stock. These people basically would sell, say that their company's worth this much when it's really worth this much. So basically they were saying, yeah, we got you taken care of. We got land and all this other stuff. They were just lying about that to get their stocks up, right? So, let's do a knowledge check. We're about five, five minutes in. We'll explain the cause of increased economy opportunity and its effect on society, right? So basically, increased economic opportunity, that means building our wealth. We talked about some of those people. Carnegie was basically poor when he came to the United States, but he died a rich man. He ended up selling one of his companies for basically over, uh, five, basically about four hundred million dollars, and that's basically in the eighteen eighties, eighteen nineties. So he was well over basically a billion dollars today. The big thing is I want you guys to take from this: American Steel basically helped push this technology age forward. In 1855, Henry Bessemer, basically, uh, he invented the Bessemer process. It was a cheaper way, basically, to, uh, to make steel. By 1900, U.S. produced more steel than both English and Germany combined. Think about that. We were number four in manufacturing by the 1860s. By the 1890s, 1900s, we were number one in manufacturing throughout the world. This helped, basically, Carnegie rise from poverty. This helped him basically become a millionaire during this process. Again, in the making of steel, they used basically a, cheap, a cheaper way to do make steel and basically send it out to the world. Oil is another way that basically provided economic opportunity. 1859. We were using kerosene oil in the 1850s leading up to basically 1859 1860s. Then they invented basically the combustion engine. Once the combustion engine was made, basically we needed oil. So, within this 30 years, you start seeing this oil take off. 1882, Rockefeller controlled 95% of the oil refiners in the United States. Again, he used horizontal integration. If I have a competitor, I'll buy him out, right? So, guess what? All that land, all the competition belongs to me. So now that's called horizontal integration. Remember, vertical integration is when I control the whole process. Horizontal integration, that's basically when I take care of all my competitors. Think of it like a battlefield. So, you have these people basically gaining mass amounts of wealth. You have these people basically trying to take up for them why it was good for American society to gain these mass amounts of wealth. So, then how do we defend wealth? How do we justify those people making money and basically, those people are not making money. One idea was called the social Darwinism. Remember, Darwin created, you know, came up with this idea about, you know, survival of the fittest. And that's what he was saying. Basically, social Darwinism when it comes to basically making money. This is going to play a huge aspect during this time frame, especially when we talk about the Gilded Age. We want to talk about imperialism. This is a huge aspect of it. Survival of the fittest, right? I work hard so I get to survive and make this money, right? I get to basically dictate how I spend my money. I get to basically pick the have and have nots in this society, right? Because I take all the risk as a, basically as an entrepreneur. I make it as an entrepreneur. Other people don't make it, so they didn't survive, right? So I'm the survival of the fittest because I've, I've survived this whole industry. I survived making it, right? These other people didn't survive, so they don't deserve what I have. Because I worked hard for that money, correct? Then you have this aspect of gospel of wealth. And this, basically, you still see this in American society today. Basically, the gospel of wealth. Basically, that's using your wealth to benefit society. Uh, we talk about this time frame like in the 1880s, 1890s. Um, this, is a big time, this is a big time because after Carnegie sold his business to, to J.P. Morgan, he realized that he needed to benefit society. Remember, he came over here as an immigrant, dirt poor. So in the Midwest, you're going to see these Carnegie libraries. You see Carnegie Hall. He wanted to benefit society as a total, right? These Carnegie libraries, you see them in small towns all throughout the Midwest. Uh, these basically provide opportunities for people to learn, for, for people to read. This gave opportunities basically for plays and stuff to, to, to see throughout the United States. So you see Carnegie, basically, his name on a lot of things, especially these dance halls. You see them on the libraries. 
even some schools uh, have Carnegie's name on it. Because he basically wanted to invest wealth on the future of society, on future American society. So that's the difference when you talk about Captain of Industry. You know, you talk about the J.P. Morgans of the world, even though he did donate some money. Um, and you talk about the Carnegie's of the world. You know, these people wanted to basically make the world better for themselves. You want to make it better for everybody. All right, so let's time to do some we do. How has rapid industrial development been a blessing or a curse for, for Americans, right? So how has it been a blessing? It basically created these super multimillionaires. People basically started making money. People, you know, we, you saw social advancement. So that's a blessing, right? But it's also a curse because it also left some people behind, correct? So you start seeing basically the ugliness in Americans. Should business be allowed to combine or reduce competition? Think about that. Should they be able to combine or reduce competition? Is basic competition good for American society or is it bad? You explain that one to me. Should business be regulated closely by the American government? So should government be in a business of telling people what to do with their money? Should they be in a business of basically dictating is competition good or is competition bad in American society? As we start going through the populist movement, this basically is going to go through, be one of our questions leading to the, 19, to the 19th century, right? To the 20th century, excuse me. That's going to be... One of those questions, should government really regulate what goes on in business? That's going to be one of those ongoing questions that we need to be answering, right? So, we asked some of those questions, and one of those lingering questions is going to keep coming back and forth in American society. So now, we're going to be you do. So, we discussed the Gilded Age and how it was formed, and who benefited from those, right? You need to write one paragraph defending an argument against government policy during this time frame. Was it really fit, did it really fit a gilded age? Or basically what we set up throughout American histories for a gilded society? Were we basically set up for American basic politics to dictate that we have half versus have nots? Has it always been that way? What you know from American society that you can bring into that? I want you to contextualize that point. All right? How did it linger over American society? That's one question that you need to answer throughout this whole course. I appreciate you guys spending time with me. I'm Paul Turner, Social Studies Coordinator, Kansas City Public Schools. See you guys next week.